Greetings everyone and welcome back to 365 Days of Prague. Today we're gonna be reviewing the album National Health by the band National Health. Hi, my name's Naomi. I'm an avid progressive rock fan, but I'm a long ways from knowing all the Prague albums out there. But this year, I'm gonna give it a try. This is 365 Days of Prague. I'm not entirely sure if I ever talked about this, but I do believe that I have, but I have this tendency on the series of course calling self-titled albums their name. So with this case today, of course, I'm calling this album National Health because it is a self titled album and the reason that I'm doing so is because if I weren't to do so we just have a lot of videos on the series called ST and then the name of the band and I just don't like that so I really want it to be like you know with an actual name so today's album is going to be called National Health because that's what I find to be most fitting but anyway here's some of my favorite bits from this album <laughs> So here we are today, coming back into National Health for one final time, and I must be perfectly honest with all of you guys, I do feel like in today's review case I was dealt with some pretty weak cards. Now when I say that I basically mean two things. The first one is that, well, about a month ago, I do believe I reviewed the album of Cues and Cures by National Health, which is their second studio album. And in that review, I basically detailed all there was to detail about this band's backstory. And well, I kind of just didn't leave any for today's review. And the reason for doing so is because even when I reviewed of Cues and Cures, I didn't have that much to say about the album's music and to fill up time in the video. I just wanted to talk about their history. And secondly, as a derivative of what I've just said, this album isn't really that special in many ways. Yes, it is a very classic Canterbury album, and yes, a lot of people love this one, but when it comes down to it, I don't find a lot of this resemblances between this one and a lot of other ones that came out of Kent at that certain time in history. Yes, this is pretty much your average Canterbury album, of course, being chaperoned owned by the major names in the Canterbury scene, which only make it sound even more I'd have to say unoriginal, but not meaning not good. But for the sake of things, I will try and give a quick recap on this band as a whole. So in the year of 1975, two major bands in the Canterbury scene known as Hatfield and the North and Gilgamesh would break up, and ultimately the two bands would actually join forces together to form National Health that same year. And after metastasizing for about another three years with people coming in and out of the band, they finally set on a set cast of players who would together produce the band's first debut album. And as I said, after coming out with their debut album in early 1978, these guys actually experienced quite a bit of success despite it not being the high time for progressive rock, especially in the type of Canterbury. And while well, riding on that wave of success, these guys would release yet another album at the end of the same year, being of Cues and Cures. 
Now, from that point onwards, around the turn of the decade, the band would actually disband, but they would come together just one final time to commemorate Alan Gowen, who had recently passed away in yet another tribute album made up mostly of compositions that Gowen wrote himself. So all in all, when you look at a band like National Health, you can definitely tell despite their very limited time in existence, why they aren't considered to be one of the classics of the Canterbury scene. And well, when it comes down to it, as I said, while this album might not be the most original thing ever and what we hear on it has been heard many times before, I would still actually understand why people would consider this one a classic and love this one to bits. Now, when you actually come to think of things, the entire discography of this band, at least the first two albums, if you consider like the major things that they created, don't even add up to two full hours and well that's a lot to think about but when it comes down to it these almost two hours are very much eventful they have a lot of the greats playing on them of course the lineup of people to be presented on here the official members and the contributing members of the band well they're all pretty great and of course they're all being just encapsulated by Dave Stewart who is the frontman of the band and he's bringing in here all his influences from Caravan, Hatfield and whatever and it's definitely a pleasure to everyone's ears. Now what I'm gonna say right now will be a bit in contrast to what I just said and that was when basically I started listening to this album and the first thing that I noted down in my notebook I wrote down that this is not they're your usual Canterbury sound. Now at first when I listened to this album, I really couldn't quite put my finger on what I was thinking about this one and why it sounded a bit different to me. Now as the first track kept on playing, I was kind of going back and forth on myself, trying to think whether this was just your normal Canterbury or not, but as it went on, I suddenly realized what I was thinking. And well, my line of thought was something like that this sounded to me very much transically captured. Activating. Now what I mean by that is that unlike a lot of other Canterbury albums, especially chaperoned by Dave Stewart, this one isn't really in your face, just take it, you know, pompous music and a lot of grandiose keyboard solos and whatnot. But instead, this one just seems to captivate the listener and take them on this sort of a journey that sounded to me a bit dreamlike. Now with this type of sorta of experimental ambient psych space music that is very much Kent in many ways, I just had nothing to do other than to vibe along to the music. Now when I talk about this, I'm of course talking about the first track on the album being Tamendous Roads, and that one is really really nice. I enjoyed it to bits, but I do think that the real section in this album that really felt like just going floating on these clouds inside of a dream in a way was definitely the second track on the album, being Brujo. Now, Brujo is an interesting track. To me, at least, it felt like it came way back into like the whole jazz fusion idea. You know, the things that were spearheaded by the soft machine at the start of the decade, and then kind of just materialized in a different sense towards the end of said decade, but this one seems to me like it's coming back to the roots, and that's really, really cool. And of course you have Dave Stewart just going on the keyboards on here, and it's pretty nice I have to say, and despite it all sounding quite improvisational, I would also have to say that at least to me, these types of keyboard solos, especially on this track, actually sounded to me quite well calculated as well. Now then this album does its little hiccup and does something a bit funny. So we have the following track which is called Burrow Groves and this one despite having the two parts, the part one and the part two, it actually starts off with part two, especially an excerpt from it, and then we move on to part one. Now to me part two was nothing really to remember, I didn't really like that one, and part one was actually pretty nice. I liked it almost to the same extent as I liked Brood but I just think that it was a bit too falling out of grace at certain points for me so I wouldn't be calling it my favorite and again it all comes back to the point this is just your standard Canterbury sound. And of course lastly we finish off this album with the about 14 minutes long track called Elephants and this one starts off very interestingly with a guitar mimicking the sounds of elephants quite convincingly actually using of course a lot of filters but as this track goes along I really just didn't notice what was 
was going on. There were no memorable moments from this one. And honestly, I ended up giving it a rating of seven, but when I come to think of it, it was definitely too long for what it had to offer. So I think I'm gonna take it down to a six. But yeah, that's national health for you. I'm sorry for this very surface level review of this one, but honestly, I don't have a lot to say. Yes, I could have gone ahead try and dig up some very interesting pieces of information about this one and dissected it on a philosophical level, but I'm really not in the mood to do so and honestly if the music doesn't evoke that within me, I'm not the one to go ahead and try and do it on my own accord. So yeah, that was National Health. I don't think I'll be coming back to these guys anytime soon, but that is to say I don't think that they create bad music as well. There's just a lot of other Canterbury albums that I've discovered this year that I definitely want to come back to, like, you know, maybe even Moving Gelatin Plates or definitely, definitely Fish Rising by Steve Hillage. And who knows, we still have You by Gong to listen to, so the opportunities are endless, but for now, let's talk about this album's cover. Okay, when it comes down to this album's cover, I actually really, really like this one. I think that it's very well made and it's one of those few album covers that actually encapsulates a real moment of time, you know, just photographed it and it looks really, really good and it also looks planned, but at the same time, just the most natural thing to happen and I don't know, I really enjoy this. So of course in this cover what I really really like about it is that we have the four members of the band. They're just sitting together, you know, next to this hospital bed which does link back to the name National Health and they're just mocking about and I love the fact that the main point of focus is on these guys despite there being more people in the frame. And well, I don't know what all these props on the bed basically mean, they might be references to the songs on here, they might be like inner jokes or theirs, but I think it's pretty cool. And just as like an added twist, which I really, really like, we do get to see Neil Murray on there with a red shirt that actually says National Health on it, and I think that that's a cool little Easter egg. But coming back to the photographical nature of this one, I love the fact that it's a photograph. It is not something that you'd really direct as much as just capture. Yes, I am well aware that these guys were probably staging this entire thing, but to a certain extent, they don't seem like people who are posing for a picture. They just seem to be in the middle of doing something, you know, being just lads, young lads, and having a conversation, and well, this is what ended up becoming the cover photo for this one. And another thing which I did notice is the really interesting play of colors on here. We have three main colors in very interesting shades. We have the light blues, the reds, and the sort of beige yellows. And again, just capturing and managing to create something which is so somewhat methodical in this one picture really makes me appreciate this one all the more. But when it comes to the rating of this one, and with it I'm not gonna add my love for this album's cover, I'm gonna have to say that it gets a pretty straightforward rating of 7 out of 10. But that's about it guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video and stay tuned for tomorrow because we're gonna be listening to Searching for the Lost Key by the Emerald Dawn. I of course want to thank my lovely supporters over on Patreon, so thank you so much to Clay Wall and Arrest of Kings and Lindsay Haycox, you guys are just the best. And if any of you want to support me over on Patreon, you can find the link down in the description or in my about page. But that's about it guys, have a wonderful day and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Bye guys.